Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, many thanks to Audrey for arranging what's been a wonderful time. Uh, my taxi driver yesterday said there's only three days of summer, and I was here for all three of them, so. <laughs> I'm, we're, I'm from Florida, so I'm used, used to the sun. And uh, it's been a great four days for me because I've had a chance to meet with faculty and grad students and visit some schools and sort of see, see what um, science looks like at, at the preschool level and in the early grades, and this has been wonderful. And I'm looking forward to sharing information with you today. So just to begin with, uh, both in the United States and I'm sure uh, here in the UK, science is really not a major area of, of focus. Um, there's all these other things that people think are important, like language and social emotional. So given uh, young kids uh, don't have long attention spans and given all these other important things, uh, why focus on science? And a lot of people think it's like too early. You shouldn't do it with very young kids. Um, in the United States, um, under our prior president, President Obama, uh, he had two, two major initiatives, uh, one of which was an increased focus on STEM. Um, and he, he put out this statement early in his, in his uh, presidency, reaffirming, reaffirming and strengthening America's role as the world's engine of scientific discovery and technological innovation is essential to meeting the challenge of the century. That's why I am committed to making the, imp the improvement of STEM education over the next decade a national priority. So beginning early on in his administration, there was a major focus on thinking about we need to improve STEM education in this country. He was also very, very interested in focus on high quality early childhood. Um, and in the la latter part of, of his presidency, uh, he put those two initiatives together and he actually invited somewhere around 250 representatives from agencies around the country who had put in a commitment to increase STEM in early childhood to spend a day meeting with a few of us talking about why STEM is critical in early childhood and giving them some background and chance to network and work on some of these issues. And I'm not going to read this full quote to you, but when you look at the quote, but it's basically saying that beginning in infancy at very young ages, children are already developing and testing hypotheses, how their world works, are uh, making predictions. Uh, they have information uh, that they get from adults that inform and guide their behavior, and that this curiosity continues to grow and the sophistication of their reasoning and inquiry skills grows along with it. So the whole notion that science is something that is important from a very, very early age. But if, if you think about should science, despite these sort of initiatives, should science be part of early education, one way of thinking about this is quickly sort of thinking about theories of child development and how they apply to early education practices and whether the theories would reinforce having science as a major topic with young children. So I'm just going to very, very quickly talk about a couple of these theories. I imagine many of you are familiar with, you, with this, but for those of you that are not in early childhood, um, there is a major influence of a theory uh, of Jean Piaget. And what Piaget's theory argues is that children's development occurs internally through their active engagement with their environment. So for Piaget, Development is occurring, occurring inside the child's head. The, he, the child is motivated to interact with, with the world around them. And for adults, what this really means is simply to provide a stimulating and novel environment to explore. Maybe you don't want that to be your refrigerator, but the basic idea is make an environment that is appealing and interesting to kids. And what we're going to be talking about today is that what is appealing to kids is their world. And when you think about what their world is, their world is the content of science. It's the people, the plants, the animals, life science. It's the physical objects in their environment, what sinks, what floats, what bounces, what rolls. It's the world around them, their environment. It's uh, the earth, the sky, stars, and so forth. And it's the technology around them. So in thinking about making uh, the, the environment interesting, I was at a number of, of, of schools, and the environments are gorgeous. There are outdoor spaces for children to explore indoor spaces with lots and lots of stimulating material. <clears throat> so supporting science from a Piaget's perspective is clearly something that theories would support in early childhood. Now, an another influential theory that I know is highly relevant to the pedal program is Vygotsky, who argues that adults 
need to provide a stimulating environment, but they can't, as Piaget would want, sort of step back and let the child interact with their environment, but rather involve themselves in scaffolding what he calls a zone of proximal development. So for Vygotsky, uh, children will get frustrated when they're trying to uh, problem solve, and they get to a point where there's something they just can't understand, and they're not, they're not going to be able to do it on their own. They're going to get stuck. They're going to get frustrated. And the goal of the adult is to recognize that and to move the child into that zone that's very close to what the child's ready for but can't do on their own. In order for adults to do this, however, the, the adults re really need to understand the sequence of steps to follow in learning a skill. So they need to know not only where the child is and where the child was, but where the child is going to be next so that they can scaffold the child into that zone. Uh, so for Vygotsky, similar to Piaget, we want to have good interactive environments. He also wants adults to be interactive, to scaffold children into this zone of proximal development. If you've never heard of that term, just think about proximal means close, right? A zone is an area of development. So thinking about where the child is almost ready to go but can't go on their own, the adult scaffolds the child into that zone. Now, there's a third theory that you may or may not be familiar with. It's a theory by um, a uh, woman, Michelle Chouinard, uh, who wrote a very uh, nice uh, SRCD monograph entitled Children's Questions, a Mechanism for Cognitive Development. And she wants to know, do children ask questions? And if they do, why do they ask questions? What's the content and the focus of these questions? And in this monograph, she has a, a number of studies that include both small and large groups to answer these particular questions. Do children ask questions and what is the focus of these? One of her, her studies involves taking transcripts of naturally occurring parent-child spontaneous questions. Uh, this is for four children. These children are roughly from one to five years of age. And she went through the transcripts and counted in each hour how many questions did each of this, these children ask their parent. So what, what do you think the number of questions? When, when kids start to talk at like a year, a year and a half, do they ask 10 questions an hour? Less? <laughs> Michelle says more. Do I hear 20 questions? More? <laughs> yeah. So obviously the context is going to vary, but what, what this is about is for a, a long period of time on a regular basis, regardless of where the kids are, just to take the transcripts, uh, it's everything that, the, that, that uh, the child and the, and the mom or the child and the dad said, and count the number of questions and then average them by the time. You know, so sometimes, some, as you can imagine, sometimes there'll be more, sometimes there'll be less, but what do you, what do you think is the average? Uh, we're up to 20. Anyone want to go higher than 20? 50, my goodness. <laughs> Anything more? All right, so these are the data. Uh, anywhere from 70 to uh, almost 200 questions per hour. Lots and lots of questions. So Michelle also looked at the questions and said, are these information-seeking questions. What are the children asking about? Do they want to know facts, like, you know, what's that? Um, explanatory questions, how did, how did you make it go over there? Or are these more non-information-seeking attention, like, hey, mom, or can you fix this for me, or can I go outside? So what do you think the mix is between information-seeking and non-information-seeking? Is it more non-information-seeking? Is it equal? What are, what are your thoughts? Anyone want to make a guess? I don't have a prize to give out, but we could. <laughs> Pardon? In which direction? 40? 40, 40% 40, 40 information, 60. Anyone want to take a, another guess? All right, we'll go with 40, 60. The answer is uh, 91%. So as soon as children can talk, 91% of their questions are information seeking. It goes down a little bit. So by two to five, it's down to 71%. But for the most part, 
children are asking lots and lots of questions, and those questions are seeking information. So how often do parents give answers? What would you, what would you say? <laughs> Any guesses? 10%, 20%, 30%? 50? 5%. 5 okay. All right, 79% of the questions are answered by parents uh, of the one and a half to two year olds. As they get a little bit older, I think the parents, okay, you know, we can't wait till they talk, and then once they do, how do we turn them off? It goes down to 70, but it's still, still the majority of the time parents answer questions. What happens when parents don't answer questions? Children persist until they get an answer. <laughs> Right? And what is interesting ab about Michelle's research is that typically children start with a factual question, you know, like what's this? And parents will do one of two things. They'll give the child the answer, or they might think, well, why is my child asking me this question? What might they already know? How instead can I engage them in a back and forth feedback loop you know, to, to sort of explore what it is they're trying to understand? Uh, when parents give the factual answer, it's over, but if they engage the child in a feedback loop, what Michelle shows is that at the end of that feedback loop, the child now has a deeper understanding of the question that he or she asked. So these feedback loops end up being very, very useful. So to sort of summarize, uh, children ask questions when they have gaps or inconsistencies and problems in their knowledge. So they're trying to seek information. Parents give answers, but if they don't, Children persist. This back and forth exchange moves you from facts to explanation. And as she concludes, young children's questions are powerful tools for gathering information and advancing children's cognitive development. And children, you know, if you don't answer the question, they'll figure something out themselves. Kids use their own knowledge. So these two kids, I'm never having kids. I hear they take nine months to download. It's got to be a terrible internet connection, right? Very slow Wi-Fi. And again, sort of thinking about does this theory of questioning that happens at a very early age, is this relevant uh, for science? And the answer is yes, because all science inquiry starts with a question. So what kids are doing when they're asking questions, it's really science. How does my world work? To uh, sort of quickly review uh, a, a long history of lots of research in an area that's called the learning sciences, which is a combination of sort of cognitive development, psychology, and education. Uh, what you conclude from that research, and look at, the, look at the children on the side in terms of what they're doing. Children learn best, and this is not true of just children, this is all humans, when they are actively, so they're physically and mentally engaged in a goal-directed activity with meaningful to be learned concepts in a context where they can socially interact with others. So these are kids involved in science activities and uh, they're doing something that is goal-directed, meaningful, and motivated because they want to understand how their world works and they're doing it with their peers and these are the conditions that maximize learning. So science, hopefully as you can see, is ideal for early childhood and it provides a context where you can maximize the opportunity that they're going to learn. So again, science provides all of these features drawing upon young children's natural curiosity and motivation to make sense of their world. Another advantage of science is that often what we see in early childhood is fragment uh, of a daily schedule in which the teacher feels I need to, to do some reading for 20 minutes and that's done now I need to do some math for 20 minutes I need to do some activity and we know that <coughs> young children really don't learn very well in a fragmented way so when you actually look at science what you end up seeing is that science is quite integrative it involves all these other areas uh, I visited on Monday the uh, Cambridge um, primary school and I had the opportunity to watch a, a teacher do a wonderful exercise on science where she started um, telling the kids a story about two children who went out on a very bright day and she had some sort of back and forth language communication and open-ended questions. Uh, the kids got stuck out. Uh, they forgot when we were watching the time, so it came to be night. Uh, well, what did they see at night? Then the kids talked about the night star and the moons and so forth. Then it rained um, and they got stuck on a hill and all the area around them was flooded and then <clears throat> they had to figure out how do we get 
you know, home, how do we get off this hill and get past all the flooded area? And they went exploring and they found a series of materials uh, that were on the hill. Um, and the teacher showed them what all the materials were and then had them divide up into groups of three. So they were working collaboratively. And she talked about what is a prediction and we're going to make predictions. I asked them what that meant. And one of the kids said, it's guessing. She says, uh, it starts off as a guess, but we want to make it an educated guess. We want to draw on what we already know and had them as a group look at, look at these materials and determine, make predictions, which of these are going to float, which are going to sink. And they had to, so it was part, sort of a, both a language lesson and writing. So they had to write out one was, was a, a, a metal spoon. Uh, the metal spoon will sink or float because. So they had that. And then they actually got to go outside with buckets of water and the materials and explore and see if their predictions were correct. And uh, a lot of them were thinking, well, we can make a boat because there was a piece of styrofoam. So here, here was what a, was a science lesson. But when you look at it, you know, it had opportunity for, for using language, doing questioning, kids working together. Uh, as well as doing science. And it, it was natural. It's not something that was forced. All these things fit naturally into children trying to understand how their world works. And <clears throat> in terms of like thinking just about language, when you're trying to get kids to learn language, if you give them a, a series of words, like memorize these words, they could probably do it, but uh, it's difficult because what's the context? Whereas if they're manipulating materials and trying to understand a concept and you start giving them the language, that helps them understand the concept, it's meaningful to them, and they're more likely to both understand the concept better because they've manipulated it and thought about it, and they're more likely to remember those words because they have meaning and they provide, you know, like object goes into the bathtub, it goes down to the bottom, we call that sink. That's something the kids experience, and that's a nice word instead of trying to figure out what do I call it when, when uh, the soap sinks down to the bottom and I can't find it anymore. So again, science involves all of these areas while drawing upon children's natural curiosity and motivation to make sense of their world. I have uh, little publications about uh, research support for this and I'll give you uh, this PowerPoint and, and all, these pub all the publications are listed at the end when we get to that. So just to sort of give you a feel for what this is going to look like in a classroom, what I want you to, to focus on, so the boy, uh, all the way on the corner, um, facing us in the vest, and uh, the girl with her back towards, towards us. Uh, the two, he, he's a uh, relatively new kid to the United States. Uh, he uh, is Chinese and he cannot speak English. The girl does not speak Chinese. So these two children are unable to talk to each other. But as you can see, they're cooperating and trying to build a ramp structure together. And what's going to happen is, she is having trouble. He's actually uh, quite good at building ramps. Uh, she's going to have a little bit of trouble and start to struggle. Watch her struggle and watch his interaction with her. So what did you notice in that interaction? So obviously no talking, but do you think, were they communicating? How were they communicating? Eye contact and sort of confirmation, trying uh, iterative um, options to see which sort of was agreeable. Yeah, so, so exactly. So uh, he, he was able to, so he, he's showing empathy. He's able to see that she's getting frustrated. Uh, he knows he can't talk to her. So what does he do? He looks, you know, he moves over and looks her right in the face to get her attention. He looks at her and he says, I can help you. Here's a block. Would you like me to build, the, build, the, build it with a block like this? And what does she do? She goes, no. Does he say, okay, well, forget that. No. He shows, I know, I'm good at math. I understand uh, concepts of, of objects and their orientation. How about this way? Right? What does she do? She says, no, okay. How about this way? He turns it a third way. She then shakes her head. Right? He then builds it. 
But as he's doing it, he's making sure that she's watching. So he's not building it for her. He's trying to teach her how to do it. So, he's, so she's watching. And then what does she do when he finishes? She thanks him. She nods. Okay? So again, um, th this is uh, science, the, the, the sort of the, the structure is a science activity. But you can see there is, despite the fact that they can't talk to each other, there is nice communication going on, there's social emotional, there's sharing, there's working together, there's cooperation, all in the context of kids having fun building a structure. Now I want to play it one more time, and this time I, I want you to watch the teacher over here in the corner and watch what the teacher does. teacher. She's supposed to know the theory and just let him Right, so you notice, she, so she, does she notice that this child is starting, starting to get frustrated? Right. How do you, how do you, how do you see that she notices that? <coughs> she, moves right. she moves forward, she gets up in a position to help, right? But then she notices uh, the boy is helping her. So what does she do? She, she doesn't jump and run in there, I need to fix this, right? She, sits back a little bit, she's watching, you know, to make sure it's going well. It went well, then what does she do? She smiles and sits back, right? So again, there's often, uh, Audrey and I have had a number of conversations about uh, the last few days about sort of the whole issue of scaffolding uh, and teachers often wanting to sort of rush in, but uh, a lot of it is being really good observers and seeing when you need to rush in, but when there's something going on in which the kids, for example, you know, are helping each other and can resolve the situation and if she would you know, have gone, it would probably have been an interference versus here's a really nice interaction among these children. I also wanted, wanted to, to show you that uh, when you're doing science, uh, an area of, of um, an evaluation that we use in the U.S., I'm not sure if you use it here in the U.K., it's called the CLASS, the Classroom um, Assessment Scoring System. And the CLASS has uh, these three domains. Uh, one of the domains is called instructional support, um, and it's an a, a, uh, area of, of very concern in the United States because uh, th this instrument is measured on a 1 to 7 scale, where 1 to 2 is low, 3, 4, 5 is average, 6 to 7 is high, and instruct the other two areas, which we'll talk about in a minute, tend to be in the high range, 5, 6, 7, Whereas instructional support tends to be very, very low on average around the country in preschools in the U.S. It's in the one-two range and, you know, you just get a one for doing nothing. Uh, and what instructional support is about is, is moving from rote learning to focusing on concept development, so teaching children how to think and problem solve and how to brainstorm. It involves when children ask questions not to give them the answer but engaging them in feedback loops that we saw from Michelle Chouinard's work is really good for children because it helps them create a deeper level of understanding of a concept. And it also involves language. We want to go into a classroom and hear lots of language and a lot of rich language. And we want teachers to introduce new terms, but not just to throw out lots and lots of terms, but to be very thoughtful about what are a small number of terms that are, are meaningful and relevant to the children that they can begin to use across the day and focus on those terms. And if you do those sorts of things, you get very high scores. But for the most part, most classrooms don't do this very well, and the scores are in the one to two range. So uh, what one of my grad students and I did is we um, asked a number of our teachers if we could videotape four typical sort of teacher-led activities a storybook reading, a science activity, a math activity, circle time. Uh, we told them uh, you can do this, how you normally do these activities are part of what they're supposed to be doing. Just let us know when you want to do it and when you want us to come in and videotape. We don't care what the lessons are. We expect they'll be about 20 minutes, but you know, it's totally up to you. And we gave them all the same book. Uh, and it was a book that we thought we knew was appropriate for that age range. None of them had used that book. We said, you know, you can look at the book as much as you want, but the first time you read it to the children, you know, can you let us videotape? So uh, what we found was 
The other two domains, emotional support and classroom organization, emotional support is providing a very warm, um, safe environment for children. And what, what you see is that emotional support, which is providing a nice, warm, safe environment, classroom organization that's having an activity that's well organized. You know, you, if you did a, uh, an experiment with water, you would make sure you had paper towels because you know there's going to be a spill. If you don't, you've got to run off and get them. So you know, that's not really a uh, well organized uh, activity. Those are identical. But when you look at instructional support, what you find is that concept development, this whole notion of, of, of getting kids to, to, to brainstorm and think about ideas as opposed to rote learning, quality of feedback and language modeling happens to a much greater extent when you're doing science than any other activities. And these were not teachers who were involved in any science intervention. Uh, for the most part, if you were to evaluate the science, it was pretty poor science. A lot of it was uh, making volcanoes out of Play-Doh and putting in baking soda and watching it explode. But nonetheless, uh, teachers are likely when they're doing science to make, have kids make predictions, uh, to ask open-ended questions, to get them to think of, of you know, how can we, we can uh, design, plan and carry out this investigation. So regardless of how, how good the quality is, we tend to get more uh, of these high quality interactions when science is happening. So just to give a sort of brief summary of what I've uh, talked about so far, science really, in my mind, is an ideal context uh, for implementing best practices for both pe teaching and learning early childhood. Why? It's about a child's immediate world. You know, it draws upon their curiosity about how the world works. Doing science involves hands-on, minds-on, goal-directed, collaborative approach to learning produces high engagement, motivation, and interest. That's what we want to happen to maximize learning. It's a process for answering questions, which promotes higher order thinking, and it pr promotes learning across multiple domains. And as that last uh, set of data showed, it's a context for high quality teacher-child interactions. Now, what happens um, in, in a lot of the places that I end up visiting teachers uh, no, I'm coming to talk about science, and I'm going to meet with them, and they apologize for not doing science, and they say, uh, we know it's important, but we have to do language, we have to do math, we don't really know how to do science. Uh, uh, we would wish we could do more, but, you know, it's, it's hard. Kids are going to ask us questions. We, we don't know the answers. We don't know how to do science. Uh, <clears throat> and what we end up um, showing them is that science is actually happening in their classroom. So part of, part of our goal in working with teachers is to make the science visible that's already there. And let me just show you uh, this uh, video. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white People get that? But did you see the moon walking <laughs> So, as the video says, it's easy to miss something you're not looking for, right? And uh, we all have that experience, it's like you buy a new car and all of a sudden everyone has that car on the road, it was never there before, but you know, you're now noticing because you're paying attention. So one of our goals is, is, is to really help teachers see the science that's already happening because kids are doing science, they're interested in understanding how their world works. So uh, for teachers that don't feel comfortable with this, uh, like where, where should you start? Like you like beer, which beer should you take first? Uh, and our answer to this is a conceptual framework that we have borrowed from uh, the K-12 education system in the United States. This is a new framework that was recently developed in the United States as a result of both having to do science testing 
um, at the state level to show that uh, children, children were making, students were making adequate yearly progress, as well as concerns over uh, U.S. students not doing well on international tests. And it took a number of years to sort of analyze uh, what was the problem with science education in, K in the K-12 system. It was uh, fragmented, covered lots and lots of topics at a very shallow depth that was uh, we referred to as being a mile wide and an inch deep. It was disconnected from students' everyday lives. It was often demonstrated by uh, a teacher as opposed to getting the kids involved. There's a lot of memorization. So what this new framework is, um, it looks somewhat complicated, but uh, if you divide it out into the three major components, the first part of it is that students must learn science by doing science. You must engage them in scientific practices, making observations, asking questions, making predictions, developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations, and so forth. And <clears throat> the K-12 system is designed to acquire, instead of huge amounts of information on lots and lots of topics, in-depth information on a small set of topics. So there are now four disciplinary core areas, or ideas, in the science framework. There are the three traditional ones, physical science, earth and space, and life science. But we have added engineering, technology, and the application of science as a fourth disciplinary area. And each of those have, as you can see, no more than four, sometimes three, sometimes only two, big ideas that are required to be the content focus of science from kindergarten through 12th grade. And as children are learning this specific content, it's not specific in the sense it's very specific things, but it's specific big ideas by engaging in the scientific practices of learn science by doing science, we also are exposing them to what are called cross-cutting concepts, that third piece over there. And the cross-cutting concepts, if you think about what cross-cutting means, these are concepts that are available in all areas of science, but in reality, they're available throughout life. They're everywhere. So uh, no matter what it is you're trying to understand, if you look for patterns, they're going to be there. They're going to help you understand what you're trying to make sense of. If you look for cause and effect, it will be there. It will help you understand what you're trying to make sense of. Similarly, scale, proportion, and quantity, systems and system models, structure and function, stability and change. So this three-dimensional approach is what's being used uh, in kindergarten through 12th grade. And um, what I have done uh, with my research team is we have taken this exact framework and, if we, and we've asked, can you apply this to babies? Can you apply this to toddlers and preschoolers? preschoolers, and the answer is absolutely yes. And we have a lot of evidence that this works really, really well with young kids. And uh, what we are doing is we're working with infant, toddler, and preschool uh, teachers, largely working with, with low-income, at-risk kids. We're helping them see the framework and use the framework <coughs> to see the science that's already happening in their classroom and uh, with their children. And we have a notion, uh, and we haven't been disproven, that science opportunities are everywhere. So we're not creating a CAN curriculum that we expect everyone uh, to use just to drop it down everywhere and it's relevant because we know that really doesn't work very well. So what we end up doing is, is we look at what are the opportunities that are available in a particular uh, culture and in a particular area. Uh, the children's interests, what's happening at home, the cultural aspects of, of what's of interest. And we make the, that visible as science and as a focus of let's answer the questions about the world that you live in, what's real and relevant, whether you, you know, you're living in a rural village in China or here in the UK or somewhere in the United States. Every child <coughs> has people and animals and plants and things and um, a house and an environment. Uh, and they're interested in understanding that, so take advantage of what's already there. So our approach is don't change what you're already doing, keep doing what you're doing, but make the science visible and help the children learn by doing and understanding these cross-cutting concepts. And a big advantage for us is that by using this framework, we'll be able to link birth to five science education to the K-12 system so that when children leave our preschool program at five, they don't need to think about, okay, now I need a whole new language, a whole new system. There will be the connection. 
They won't get knocked in on and disappeared. We'll be able to, to find them. So <clears throat> one of the ways we, we present this to teachers so it doesn't appear so complicated uh, is we say the disciplinary core ideas are what children are interested in. So see what they're interested in. And part of their interest is going to be questions. They're going to be asking questions. So what can children do to answer their questions? That's engaging them in the practices. And what children, what are they trying to understand in terms of the questions and their interests? Those will be the focus of the cross-cutting concepts. So uh, just to give you some, some sense of, of how this works and how th this is really a nice structure for teachers to work with kids. Uh, sink and float is an activity that, that happens in toddler classrooms and preschool classrooms. And you could design the activity um, in almost any way, you know, take a whole bunch of stuff, give it to the kids, they can play with it. But if you use the framework and you think about what is the cross-cutting concept or what is the concept I want to teach the children, then it, it allows the teachers, with help from, say, a coach and in planning a lesson, to be much more intentional and rigorous about how you choose materials to make a particular concept visible. So, for example, suppose the, te the teacher wants uh, to get the kids to understand that uh, there are properties of objects that vary based on sort of what they're made of. So in order to do that, what you, wh what you want is to pick some object, like it could be a spoon, it could be a fork, it could be you know, almost anything, and provide the children with all of that same object. So here's, here's six spoons, they're all spoons, but some are made of plastic, some are made of metal, some are made of wood. And what are your predictions about which ones are going to sink or float? And then in analyzing you know, your results and seeing if your predictions were correct, you now have the children focusing on <coughs> what, why are some of these sinking and floating. It can't be because some are spoons, because they're all spoons. They're all identical. The only difference is the material. So it gets the children to begin to think about the material versus if you had a spoon, like a plastic spoon and a metal fork and, and, and um, a, a, a wooden knife, you know, and, and some sink and, and some float to the kids' wall. Is it the fork that floats? Is it the knife that floats? So by simplifying, it makes it uh, much easier by focusing on a concept that you're trying to teach. Suppose you want to teach some structure function. What you could do then is take the same material <coughs> and uh, get the kids to to modify its structure to see if that has a difference in, in its function. So for example, take something like Play-Doh, you know, that you can easily modify. And you can ask the children, what kind of shape could you make the Play-Doh in such that you think it's going to sink and why? And then experiment with that. Well, how can you take that same material and make that material float? How would you change the structure? You know, and kids will naturally, and you can ask them to draw on their experience, what do you know about this topic? And, you know, they'll tell you things well, like boats float. Well, what is, what is the, the structure and shape of a boat? Take your Play-Doh, make it into a boat. Is it going to float? And the kids will see that a ball sinks, uh, a boat floats, and it has nothing to do with the Play-Doh, because in both cases they're Play-Doh. So now they're beginning to think about uh, the late relationship of the structure of something and its property. Another thing, take, take advantage of, of, of what you see the kids interacting. And so this is a typical playground. Often playgrounds have similar sorts of things. They're not always these animals. But these are things the kids love to, to sit on. Uh, you sit on it, it you know, ro rocks back and forth, it moves, and the kids get off and they have fun. But as a teacher, you could, you could ask them to, you know, let's look at this object and let's like, think about uh, what it looks like, what it's made of, what its parts are, and like, what do you think that thing is on the bottom? And you can begin to talk about its shape. It's in the shape of a spiral, right? Um, it's a spring. What is the, the structure and function relationship of, of a spring? What is the cause and effect relationships of spring? So you, you could take each of those concepts and spend some time getting the kids to think about it. Uh, you can talk about force and motion and how that works. You can talk about systems. You know, there's parts. The, the, the thing has a place to sit on, but and that you wouldn't be sitting on the spring. Uh, you can begin to talk about size um, and proportion by asking them, well, uh, wh how does the spring work in this situation? Or they get on it and play with it and try it. Where else do you see, sp see springs, right? 
So here, this is my pen. I push my pen down, the point comes out, I push it again, the point goes up. Why, why is it doing that, right? Ask the kids, what do you think is going on in here? They could take it apart and guess what? There's a spring in there. You take it apart, leave the spring off, what's going to happen? Push on it, it just hangs down there and, and the pen doesn't work. So the spring has the same sort of function in the pen that it does uh, on, on those toy horses, but it's slightly different size and proportion, but the shape is identical. We have children um, play with these wind-up toys. Uh, they learn a lot about, normally these are things that you're giving out at birthday parties, kids play 10 minutes and throw them away. But if you ask the children to first play with it and then let's do some science. Let's observe what this thing does. Uh, and they learn about, also can learn about how, how you have to wind it only in a certain direction, which is a principle. You know, all things tighten in one direction and loosen in the other. So if I go this way, it's not going to work if I turn it this way. And uh, I'll let you play with this if you want. Uh, what it does is it, it goes straight, then it turns around in a circle, then it flips. Uh, these are actually made in China. I was just in China. This is cool. But uh, they, they then, then you ask them, well, what do you want to know about this? And like, how does, well, how does it do what it does? How are you going to find out? Well, it turns out there's two little Phillips screws on the bottom. You give the kids the screws. They start taking this thing apart. And guess what they find inside there? Spirals and springs. And we've, we've had a couple of classrooms where the kids now want to go spring exploring and spiral exploring all over the classroom. Uh, they took the, the soap dispenser, you, or you push down, and they said, there is a spring in here. And the teacher says, well, let's wait until, we, until the soap is empty, and then we can take it apart. And is there a spring in there? Yes, there was. And they said, let's put it back together, leave the spring out. What's going to happen? We're going to push down. It's not going to go up. That's exactly what happens. <coughs> so uh, you can begin to look at what's in the environment, think about these cross-cutting concepts, and then begin to design activities that really focus on understanding by getting the kids involved physically and mentally, thinking about and doing the practices, and learning about how their world works. Just sort of as thinking about this notion and, and why we value cross-cutting concepts is that you can use these really across the entire curriculum, right? Once you do them in science, patterns are happening all over the classroom, cause and effect, structure function. It's not just science, it's everything that's happening in the classroom. So the teacher can begin to really build children's understanding, not just in a science experiment, but almost in everything they end up doing. <coughs> uh, for those of you that are, that are working with young kids, uh, you're probably interested sort of how do you do this with babies. And the idea here is to get the adults to really pay attention to what babies are doing and what babies are interested in. So uh, often what, what you're told is you have, babies need some, some stomach time. We put them down in their stomachs. Uh, do they like that? No, they don't like that at all. They squirm. Uh, they don't want to be on their stomachs. However, put something interesting in front of them. What all of a sudden happens, the squirming starts and they try to lift their head up to see like what is that thing? They're looking at it. Uh, if you keep putting, inter putting them on their stomach and put interesting objects in front of them, they're going to start to try to uh, strengthen the, the muscles here and then put their arm up so they can get closer. They're going to uh, eventually be able to reach for it. And once they're ready, uh, if you put an object a reasonable distance away, it's going to in, in, motivate their crawling behavior. So their motor behavior and their development is motivated by exploration of the world. <laughs> so I mean, if she's not yet crawling, but she's using her reaching and squirming behavior, why? If that book wasn't there, she wouldn't be doing this, right? She's doing it because that, that's one of her favorite books, Good Night Moon. So here is a toddler. Uh, his parents took him, him out uh, to the park. They get out of the car, um, and he puts on his helmet. They're going on a bike ride, and he's looking around as, as his parents get the bike ready, and he finds a bottle cap on the floor. Okay, He looks at this bottle cap, and right away, he's thinking about a structure-function relationship. 
this thing goes on something. What could it possibly go on? Well, it's sitting here next to my dad's tire. Maybe this fell off my dad's tire. I'm going to help. I'm going to fix my dad's car. He's going to really be happy. Uh, I'm going to figure out where this thing came off from. Like, where is it? Where does it go on the tire? So, you know, if you start to look at infinite toddler behavior from this lens of science, you know, he's not picking up something random and trying to like poke a hole in the tire. What what this child is doing is he <coughs> understands a simple structure function relationship, and he's he's using his knowledge. Oh, maybe this came off my dad's car. How can I fix the car? <coughs> I'm going to speed up because I, I want to cover a bunch of topics, but at least uh, talk about how we're doing this. So we also co-construct programs with families, and the same sort of message uh, that we give to the teachers, we give to the, to the families, and get them to see that the science, the, uh, the technology, the engineering is everywhere. It's in your home, in your community. Examine playgrounds, examine, uh, this is an area where they have a community garden uh, that they share space. That's, you know, what's the science in that kitchen? Also, the whole notion of take advantage of local context. So this is a program uh, that we're doing um, in an area of Boston near the airport where there's tunnels and bridges. This is what the kids see on their way to school. This is what they build. So they're building what they see. This is uh, another site that we have in Boston and Back Bay uh, with the Chinese population. And this is what they see. This is what they build, right? They're all learning. Uh, structure function, stability and change, how to make, make uh, uh, buildings and, and build structures, but we're not saying you have to do it this way. Take advantage of what's in the local context. Uh, we also uh, created, and again, uh, you have links to this, I'm, I'm uh, the science engineering advisor for the Head Start, uh, National Head Start Center on Child Development, Teaching and Learning. Uh, we got Boeing Corporation to give, give us some funds to create videos for parents. So these are two videos, they're about four minutes long, one's in English, one's in Spanish. What it does is it shows parents interacting in very typical kinds of activities with their infants and their toddlers and their preschoolers. These are things that happen pretty much in lots of families, but the narrative is look at, look at, your, at your baby as a scientist, look at what they're doing. They're exploring cause and effect, they're trying to make sense of their world. To give parents, again, sort of a lens of looking at the interactions around science, and we have a lot of support materials that are on the website to go with this. I'm also very interested in, in looking at the relationship between children's development and these domain general areas. These are things like executive function and approaches to learning. So some readiness areas uh, have important skills, but the skills are specific to that area. So I learn how to tie my shoes, that's useful, but does that help me make friends? Um, if um, I learn language, does that help me with math? So you have these domain specific skills, but then you have things like approaches to learning, which involve getting kids to be more persistent when they're learning, to show initiative, preference for challenge, executive function skills, being able to inhibit less efficient strategies, to be flexible in your, in your problem solving, to use your working memory. And it turns out that science supports the development of these important skills. And we have a number of publications that support that, but I want to show you what this actually looks like. So uh, what you're going to see is this is a boy who decided uh, during free play he was going to build a ramp structure to go from one end of the block center to the other end. Um, and this video is an hour long. I can not keep you here for an hour. But uh, what's happened so far is he starts to build the structure and uh, he initially has a series of ramp pieces. The first one's way too high, so his because he figures it's got to go. It's a long distance. It's got to start off fast. But it, he has it so high when the marble gets to the bottom of the first ramp, it just hits it and bounces straight up. So he starts to lower that. And then he puts the pieces, the ramp pieces together. But it's complicated because it's a long ramp, and you have to have the pieces line up perfectly. But as he moves one, the end of the other, of the other end misaligns. It's quite difficult. And every time he tries it, the marble falls off somewhere. So his teacher comes over, seeing he struggles. So the teacher's not interfering initially. She's letting him do this. But seeing that he's getting frustrated, and he has, you know, he's just constantly trying to do the same thing. So she comes over and talks to him about, uh, you know, what's the nature of the problem? He says, well, the marble keeps falling off. He says, well, she says, well, you know, have you ever seen any situations where, where something might fall off somewhere 
uh, what, what do people do to make sure it doesn't fall off? And they say, yeah, well, I, you know, when we drive home, you know, there's an area of the road where there's a, like a, a, a section so we don't, you know, drive off the, the edge. So the teacher says, well, does that give you any ideas? So what he ends up doing is he then builds walls around the ramp pieces so the marble doesn't fall off. And he succeeds in that task. Now the teacher says, this is great, but she thinks like, how can I challenge the child to do something else? And she now asks him, what I would like you to do is, you made the marble go straight across, can you make the marble go into the cubby that's uh, two to the left of the one that you were in? He goes, oh yeah, no problem. So he takes that last piece, what does he do? He just moves it over, and this is gonna work. He rolls the marble down, what does the marble do? Does the marble do what he wants, decide, okay, get to this corner, go that way? It does not, it goes straight, he tries it a couple times. But what's happening is he's engaging in um, his executive functions, thinking about why didn't this work, what do I need to do? And what I'm gonna show you here is a situation where he's now, with the help of the teacher, put something to block it, to figure it out how do I, stop, I slow it down so it doesn't go too fast, because if it goes fast, it hits that corner and stops. So I can't make it go too fast, but I've got something to block it. Uh, and he's now trying to get, get uh, the marble to go to that side. So he's now realizing, well, maybe I slowed it down too much. It's not getting all the way. So how does he problem solve to fix that? So now his teacher instead of, okay, let's not stop. Let's see if you can get it to go the other way. So I've labeled this adult's critical role in unleashing the power of science in early childhood education. And the idea here is, is that teachers don't need to teach all the time, but they do need to step in. They need to know when to scaffold, when the child is clearly getting frustrated and doesn't know what to do next. Uh, and again, not tell the child what to do, but to give them hints and suggestions and try. So he remembers he had to put something there to block, block it, but notice where, where he put it, on the same side as where it was last time. And what does a marble do? Now it goes straight. So here, here is his final solution after a couple more tries. And now notice he built the wall on the other side this time. <laughs> and success. So again, um, from a lens of science, really understanding how you're trying to build concepts to really deepen children's understanding, to extend it to, to other areas using the same underlying concepts and connect it to every ch children's everyday lives. What teachers learn to do is not design an activity, okay, the kids have done it, let's stop, but constantly think about how can we challenge the kids, how can we make their level of understanding deeper and um, th this child was working on this for well over an hour, you know, a certain amount of failure and frustration, but the teacher is a scaffolding at the right sort of time, and you can see, look how happy he is, right? Major accomplishment, and he learned, he used ex his executive function skills and his persistence and his initiative uh, to solve a, a, a science problem. I'm going to very briefly mention this because I'm running out of time and uh, I just wanted to let you know that one of the things uh, we've been working on is when we do science and we want to demonstrate that it's effective and children are learning science, you have to be able to assess it. And when we started this work, there were, I looked everywhere, you know, under rugs and beds and everywhere, but there was no science assessment anywhere. So we ended up developing one and we did it through technology <coughs> and we now have two of these. 
an English one, the Lens on Science, which is a computer adaptive assessment for preschool age kids uh, that uses touchscreen technology. We have a linked Spanish version that we're working on that's almost finished. Both of these are funded by Institute of Education Science measurement grants. <coughs> Here's what an item looks like. <coughs> uh, there is a, a number of formats, but in this format, the, the strawberry appears at the top uh, in, a, in an ice cube, and, and uh, the, chil chil the child with his headphones hears what will happen when this ice cube is heated. Then the three pictures appear, and he has to choose uh, it will the strawberry disappear? Will it be sitting in a puddle of water? Uh, or is nothing happening? Uh, I'm going to quickly go through this, but uh, there's big advantages to using technology. It's much shorter administration time because since you can do it adaptively, you don't have to give everyone all the same items. The assessment runs like you know a typical adaptive. You give the child an item, they get it right, they get a harder one until they get one wrong. So you're moving them to an area where their ability is. They get the first one wrong, give them an easier one, you get one right. The software estimates uh, their ability trial by trial using a maximum likelihood estimator. Ed estimator. It's also calculating the standard error. When the standard error gets below a certain value, that's a parameter we can control. Assessment's done, typically 30 items. Kids actually, am I done? I want to play more because it's a fun activity for them. When you're doing one-on-one -on -one assessments, you have to train assessors. That's costly. You worry about assessor biases. That's eliminated when you have a test that's <coughs> automated. Everyone gets it exactly the same way. Everyone gets items that are customized to their ability. So you're testing a dog. You can use bones. You can repeat multiple times because they're not getting the same items. Uh, the item bank can be expanded over time to improve. You have much better data management instead of having to write things down and then put them, um, transfer them to a computer system. All that happens automatically. And, and then I, I want to sort of finish, um, I know I'm running out of time, but by thinking about uh, the challenges and opportunities that we are having in the United States. And um, I love the opportunity to visit classrooms. And I think there is clearly differences between the UK and the US system. But I think there's a lot of similarities. And I was part of a group uh, that created a report. We spent two years putting this report together. It's called Early STEM Matters. Uh, you can access it fairly easily on our website. And the report is divided into four guiding principles. Uh, and we've designed these principles to, to speak to researchers, policymakers, um, and researchers who want to improve STEM education in early childhood, but they're written in such a way that they're based on good principles of pedagogy and learning in early childhood. So to some extent, they're applicable to any area. So I think you know, these would be something of interest and I think they would be relevant. Here are the guiding principles. Children need adults to develop their natural STEM inclinations, right? So kids have natural inclinations, but adults are critical. When you're doing science, you have to engage the kids in thinking about it and doing it and drawing and talking. So representation and communication are really central. It's part of the whole process of engaging in practices and doing sciences. We need to change adults' beliefs and attitudes you know, because they affect children's beliefs and attitudes. If you know, go around telling kids science is hard, I can't do math, uh, math is challenging, uh, kids won't be interested in it. And then the whole notion is that <clears throat> one size does not fit all. Culture is relevant. You should take advantage of culture when you're trying to teach science. It's not the same for everyone. Then we have six recommendations <clears throat> that are based on the guiding principles. And again, we try to be very comprehensive in thinking about what this agenda should look like and what are the critical issues. And I think, again, they're relevant for the UK. Issue number one is messaging, raising the profile and understanding of early childhood STEM education, right? So lots of adults think that it's too hard, it's not appropriate for young kids, and it requires aptitude, which means you need to be an older boy, otherwise STEM is not for you. And we want to change the message that it's for everyone, it's for boys, it's for girls, and it's highly relevant at a young age. We need in the U.S. to really think about teacher preparation, both pre-service and in-service to get STEM training and support um, more central. In, in the US, uh, teachers can take maybe one class in, in STEM 
A lot of teachers go into early childhood because they don't like science or they are frightened by it. So we really need to really think how do we, do we make the teachers that are both uh, in ser free service, those are teachers in, in colleges that haven't been out yet, pre in service is ones that are already in classrooms. How do we get them to sort of see the excitement and then join, join the children in the excitement of learning about the world and using the science framework to, to improve their teaching and children's learning? Parents and families, how do we establish initiatives and resources and support for families to engage in STEM with their young children? Resources, how do we, we think about what are the appropriate sorts of quality resources to help practitioners do STEM? Standards, what, you know, what are we aiming for? We need a set of standards for what we want children to learn. And a research agenda, you know, we need to understand what the developmental trajectories are of practices and cross-cutting concepts and so forth to improve STEM education. So hopefully I uh, didn't run over too much. Um, I'm standing up here, but we have lots of, of, of um, partners involved in this, lots of funders that, that help us do this work. Um, takes, takes lots of different people with different skills to get the beer at the end of the day. I also have, have a huge research team. It's hard to get all of them in one place to get a picture, but this is some of the things. So this is a uh, top one is a, a, a Christmas party we had. Uh, one on the left was a spring party. Uh, this, this is a couple of my students and I. We went to uh, Omaha to do training. We have a t-shirt showing our robot for our early science initiative. Uh, this, this was another site we went to in Tulsa to do training and they had a little uh, hoedown gathering for us. So we. Uh, had some fun while we're there. And again, thank you very much for your time and attention.